what are some other names of Jesus? So somebody say one out. What's some other names of Jesus? Jehovah, Yahweh, Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Emmanuel, Messiah, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. There's so many names. It's because he's indescribable. We don't have enough words to truly describe everything he is. He's so much more. And so it would be foolish of me to try to preach a message about everything he is because you can't really fully do, the, do, the, do that service. But I want us to focus on one of those names today, and that's Emmanuel. Emmanuel. We're going to be in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, and verse 14. And it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now we've got to ask the question, because this was several hundred years, this scripture was written several hundred years before Jesus was born. So how do we know that Isaiah was speaking of Jesus? Well, I'm so glad the Bible doesn't leave us hanging in that essence there. The Bible, again in Matthew, at the birth of Christ, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 it quotes the prophet Isaiah and it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That word Emmanuel is used three times in our Bible, just three times, but it's the, one of the most important names of Jesus you could ever know or believe or fully trust in. The only difference in the Old Testament and New Testament is when it's translated from the from the Hebrew, you'll see that it has a, a, a letter I begins, and in the Greek, when it's translated, it has the letter E begins. And that's the only difference. The meaning is the same. It means God with us, or with us is God. And I want to focus, though, on these first few words of Isaiah 7, 14. It says, the Lord Himself. The Lord Himself. Look at your neighbor. I do this a lot, I know. It's four points for a reason. Look at him and say, the Lord Himself. All right. God was speaking in the book of Isaiah, through Isaiah the prophet, to King Ahaz. King Ahaz was king of Judah. Israel was divided. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So there was Israel and there was Judah. They was once united. At this point in time in history, they were divided. Ahaz was the king of Judah. He was a very wicked king. We know that he sacrificed his children to false idols and gods. That's wicked. Does anybody disagree? That is wicked. He was a wicked king. And he was in trouble because he was being double teamed. He had two nations coming against Judah. One of them was Syria. Believe it or not, the second nation was Israel. How many of you know it's double bad when your family's coming against you? And so Israel teams up with Syria, and they're coming against Judah. Over 100,000 people had already died in Judah because of this. And here's the problem. Ahaz was not serving God. It's bad enough to be double teamed. It's bad enough to be outnumbered. What makes it worse is when you're not serving God. Because if you have God with you, the numbers don't matter. Because God wins. But he found himself in a predicament. And it seemed hopeless. And all the promises that God had made to David about David being David's uh, lineage being uh, on the throne forever... All of those promises seem to be just washing down the drain. Seem to be just going away. But God's word, when it is spoken, always comes to fruition. And so God showed up through the prophet Isaiah in the middle of this hopeless, helpless time. And God speaks to Ahaz and says what, what I just read you. The Lord Himself. In other words, He says, it may seem hopeless. It may seem lost. And you're not helping matters because you've turned against me. But the words I spoke concerning Judah will come to pass. I will do this. He says, a virgin shall conceive or become pregnant. How many knows that that is impossible? 
we had a guy in our church several years ago, and I'll never forget it. And uh, he was trying to he was trying to say something good, but he's sort of like me, I guess, and it just didn't come out right. But anyway, he got up to testify, and he said, "Church, him and his wife have been trying to get pregnant and have a kid." He said, "Church, I got a praise report. My wife is pregnant, and I had nothing to do with it." And so the church said, "What you're doing?" He sort of giggled. He thought everybody was going to jump up and clap their hands. Some giggled. Some looked quite concerned, actually. <laughs> He was trying to say that God gave them a miracle, and what they were trying to do, God did, but he said it the wrong way. Here's the point. A virgin can't conceive. This can't happen by itself. There has to be a seed. God said, this will be my deal. The Lord himself shall do this. Another place in the Bible where I read this language or this writing is in Genesis 22 and verse 8. You remember Abraham? God had asked Abraham to offer his son Isaac, the child of promise, which Abraham and Sarah had when they were way on up there. They were old people. And God gave them a son, Isaac. And God asked, Isaac, or asked Abraham to offer his son Isaac to the Lord as a sacrifice. And so Abraham is on his way to be obedient to God, and he's heading up the mountain. And Isaac says, God, uh, Abraham, where's the sacrifice? I see the wood, I see the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And this is what Abraham said. My son, God will provide himself. In other words, the Lord himself shall provide a lamb. So they both went together. Abraham hadn't told Isaac that he was the sacrifice. But I believe by faith, and the Bible tells us later in the book of Hebrews, that Abraham believed in his heart that even if he offered his son, God would raise him up because that was his child of promise that was given by the Lord. But Abraham, through faith, said, this is all i got to give, but I believe the Lord himself will step in and provide a sacrifice. My wife will ask our uh, children to go and clean their room. I've got an eight-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl. And so this is not a particularly smooth process. And believe it or not, the four-year-old does better than the eight-year-old many times. Uh, but it always happens the same way. Go clean your room. And uh, they'll be up there for quite a while. And you can tell they're not. They're just playing now, right? So she'll yell up the stairs, have you got your room clean? No, they're playing the Wii or something like that. So she gets home. They start again. Or other times, you know, the room is a wreck. And they come down like in five minutes. And she says, did you clean your room? And he's like, yeah, I cleaned my room. We well, you know he didn't. So he's just, he just thrown his toys all under the bed or in a drawer or behind, he's threw them behind the dresser before or even just opened up the door and put them all behind the door, stacked them up to the ceiling. You know, he hasn't done it right. And so she'll get all over him and say, you don't leave till you got your room clean. But almost inevitably, because my, my kids have trained her well, I'll say, Almost inevitably, she'll just make up her mind to do it herself. Because <laughs> even when they try their best, all right, at this age, it's not perfect. It's, it's not going to meet her requirement. And so she'll do it herself, and, and she'll put the room in order like it should be. And, and why I'm saying that is because I'm so thankful that God looked at the mess in my life and just said, I'll do this myself. I'll step in and take care of it. Now, that's something to be thankful for. Because as good as we can try to do it, we just can't do it right. But God can. And that's the love of God. I can do all things with Him, but I can't do anything without Him. I'm so thankful. God was saying to them, here's your sign. When you see a virgin walking around pregnant, you'll know. It's Emmanuel. God is here. God is with him. When you see lame people jumping up and leaping for joy, you're going to know God himself has shown up. When you see a demon-possessed girl walking through town, now she's sane, now she's at peace, now she's spreading the good news, you'll know that God himself has just showed up. John the Baptist that was called to be the forerunner of Jesus, he did a great job of that. And he was sent to prison, and he was going to be beheaded. But before he was beheaded, he sent messengers to ask Jesus if he really was the one. 
And I got to thinking about that because the enemy can start working on you and speaking into your life. And so John, you know, he knew Jesus was the one because early on when Jesus first walked up to the banks of the Jordan River, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He knew Jesus was the one. But as he sat in prison, and perhaps before he knew his life was about over, he just needed one more confirmation, one more affirmation that he had done what he was supposed to do, and Jesus was going to take it from there. So he sent his messengers, and they asked him, and this is what Jesus said in chapter 11, verse 4, verse 5. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the dead hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Do you hear what he's saying? Tell John that you're seeing things that people can't do. Tell John that you're seeing things that's evident the Lord himself done showed up among us. Go back and tell John. And that's why, you know, when people that are addicted become addicted to Jesus instead, that's a sign Jesus done showed up in somebody's life. Amen. I want our church to be a church. You know, everybody might not always agree with the loud music and with the casual atmosphere and things like that, but I want us to be a church that nobody can dispute that Jesus himself has shown up and is changing people's lives. is to get people to say, I cannot dispute the fact that Jesus is showing up and doing things among His people. Church, that's what I want us to be. Some of us have no other explanation than to say, it was God. I mean, look at some of you. Right? It had to be God. Look at where some of you came from. Look at where some of you have been. Look at what some of you have done. I look in the mirror and I have to say, God done shown up. It was the Lord Himself. This is the meaning of Christmas. God chose to enter into the middle of our mess and fix it Himself. That's Christmas. That's Christmas. Hallelujah. That's why we have a Christmas tree. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Hallelujah. Somebody says happy holidays to you. Tell them Merry Christmas for me. It's Christmas. This is what it's about. But I want to talk about from conceiving to receiving because there's a process that takes place. Back in Isaiah, he said, The virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son. The word bear in the Hebrew means to, to bring forth, to get. You see, the Word was sown into Mary, and the Word came forth. The Word became flesh. The Son of God was birthed because the Word was sown. The invisible became visible. The God that no one could see all of a sudden was revealed in the Son. What God said would happen, happened. Can I tell you today what God says will happen, will happen in your life. Amen. Amen. I shared with the church this morning, I think Becky's here for this service, but uh, last week uh, there was a message given out through tongues and and, and I did what I've, what I've been doing. And I know some of you don't understand. I turned my mic off and I walked over to her and I spoke in her life what I felt like God was speaking to her. If y'all don't remember this, I don't know if some of you do, but several months back, you know, the Lord showed us and began to teach us that, that we used to be a church where tongues and interpretations happened five, six, seven times. And God spoke to the whole body. And God spoke to us and told us that He was going to change the way He speaks into our lives and that we were to grow and to mature in Him. And so you've noticed sometimes when there's a message given out, I'll flip my microphone off. And I do that because that word is not for the whole church. That word is for a person. When the word is for the whole church, man, I will belt it out as loud as I can. And I'm so glad that God does that to lift us up. But what people didn't know is Becky, and I didn't know this, Becky had been praying to God, and her prayer was, God, this is my petition. That was her words. Well, I walked, I turned my mic off, and I walked over to her, 
And I was wondering why they were all dancing when I left. But I walked over to her and I spoke to her what God was saying. I have answered your, not request, not prayer, but petition. All right? So that's why the mic was turned off. And that's why the word wasn't spoken to you. Because some of you would have went home thinking God was going to give you a hummer because you've been praying for one. <laughs> but it wasn't God's word. God was speaking today. All right? <laughs> And so God speaks to the congregation, but you know what God wants us to hear? His Word. You know what God wants you to do? Go read this yourself. I'm afraid some of us became so lazy that we thought we could just not look at the Word and come and hear this message and get God's Word all in about two minutes for our life. God says, I want you to grow. And God uses times and uses seasons and when He's pushing us into a new level, I believe He speaks prophetically to the congregation. And when He does that, guys, I'm so ready to share it. And He has done that in the past. But I want you to know there's a reason why we do things. God wants you to grow. You know what He wants you to do? He wants you to be ready to speak into somebody's life. Amen. It's not just the preacher or just the minister. We are all been filled with the Holy Spirit. We've all received Him. You speak into somebody's life. Obey the Word of God. Is that all right? So from conceiving to receiving, there's a process. What God says will happen, and whatever that petition was, I expected to happen. When God says it'll happen, it's going to happen. You can take it to the bank. You can cash that check. God's going to do it. But you got to remember this, and this is one of the most important things I say today. What He conceived in you was not conceived by you. What he conceived in you was not conceived by you. It wasn't you that did this. This is what he told Joseph. Can you imagine Joseph? Joseph was, he was scared. He was angry. He was confused. You say, how do you know that, John? Well, you think about it. He's engaged to this pretty young lady, and all of a sudden she comes up pregnant. He didn't have nothing to do with it. That was no joke. They did it the right way. They were, or at least he thought. So you want to tell me he wasn't angry? I promise you he was angry. He was confused. He was afraid. The Bible says he already made up his mind to get a divorce. Because being engaged back in that day was for real. It was serious. So they would go through the divorce process even if the engagement. And he had grounds for it because she committed adultery. In his mind... So this is all the things. And look what it says in Matthew 1, 20, 21. But while he thought on these things, and that's a message in itself. He was thinking all these things. That's what the devil does. Some of you, somebody will tell you one sentence at church, you know, that don't sit right with you. You'll go home and think on it. Write three books about it. What they meant, what they were feeling, you know, what they really wanted to say to you. That's the way the devil works in our minds, in our hearts. And some of us are in a, 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 just a, all, a big mess because we've taken one thing said and you've written books in your own heart and in your own mind. You've thought about those things. But he says, he, while he thought on those things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. What was conceived in you was not conceived by you. So very important. Jesus would become the second Adam. The first Adam sinned. We were all infected. When we were born, we were born in sin. We didn't have a choice. But just to make it fair, we continued to sin. We continued to rebel. We had that seed of Adam that was infected by sin. <coughs> Jesus was not born of the seed of Adam, but was conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit so that he could begin a new family. I'm so thankful I'm part of that family now. I've been unborn, all right? Or I died to the seed of Adam. And now I'm part of a new family, which is of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. I'm part of the kingdom of God. 
But what was conceived in me was not conceived by me. Do y'all get that? So very important. Very important. Between the conceiving and the receiving is almost always, almost always, there's some time of pain. There's some time of discomfort. Let me read you the rest of the definition of bear, that she would bear a son. Let me find it. Bear, in the Hebrew, to bring forth, to beget, to travail. How many moms know what travail means? Only three of y'all. The rest of y'all were highly medicated, I guess. I had three raised their hands. They probably I don't know if they didn't have epidurals back then or what. You know what it means to tra the rest of them say, I was knocked out. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but you've done all your travailing after the fact, right? Raising that kid. So we know what travail. Between the conceiving and the receiving, there was some travail. There was some birth pains. There was some discomfort. That is true in the physical. It's also true in the spiritual. When God gives you a word... When you take hold of something and the seed is planted in here, before you receive that, almost always there is some time of struggle. There is some fight. When you make up your mind to do this right, when you make up your mind to give it to God, there's going to be some pain involved. There's gonna, the devil will fight this. Did you know part of the Christmas story was that many, 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 many kids died? The devil got so mad that Jesus was going to be born. That they had every kid under two years old, every male child under two years old, killed. We don't talk about that much, but that's the devil fighting against the seed. But the devil can fight, but the seed's going to come forth. That's the word to you today. What God has spoken, He's going to do it. What He's planted in here inside of you, many of you, you've, many of you in the last couple of months, we've had several of you that's given your life to Jesus. I was so excited to watch part of our year in review video that Jeff made for us. He was giving me a preview of it. And I forget how many were there baptisms on the 26? No? What? 25? 2? 5. Is that right? 27. Do what? 27. Well, okay. That's hard to do 27 with two hands. I understand now, Jeff. <laughs> 20, ain't that great? 27 people baptized. This past year. Well, what happens is this, and many of you can attest to this, is when the seed is planted, there's a fight. There's a fight. For many of you, there's been a fight. For many of you, the devil's made you doubt your salvation. Some of you have tried to walk away and couldn't because God's got you. The seed that's been planted, it's going to grow, guys. It's going to blossom. Everything God spoke in your life is coming to pass. Amen? That's good news. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. That's just, I don't remember if we ever had before. It's possible. I just don't remember. I, when we first moved into the church, and we actually had a baptism besides the swimming pool or Cane Creek or, or uh, Henry Neely. You know, I think everybody in the church got baptized. They just want to know what it was like to have warm water. You know, so many of you got re-washed, re you know. So you need to be rewashed again, amen? amen? But I don't know if we've ever baptized 27 people in a year. Whatever, that's an amazing thing. A seed has been, and it's a game changer. It's a game changer. I'm going to try to wrap this up. I'm so excited about this message. I can go to 2 o'clock. I got no amens just then. Game changer. Game changer. If you can truly get this, that God is with you, it's a game changer. Emmanuel. Now, this is not a new concept, though. God has always been Emmanuel. It was different when Jesus came, but he's always been Emmanuel. He was with Adam and Eve in the garden. He walked with them. Enoch walked with God, the Bible says. Noah was shut in the ark and God guided him. He was with him. He was with Moses, the burning bush. He was with Moses, the cloud by day, the fire by night. He was with Moses in the tent of meeting. He was with Joshua. Listen to what he said to Joshua. No one will be able to stand up against you all the day. Isn't that a good word? No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. 
Hey, that's a word for you. You can take, this is why though. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He was with Gideon when Gideon faced overwhelming odds. He was with David. There was a man after his own heart. You know what David said? He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. He's always been Emmanuel. He was with John the Baptist inside the womb of Elizabeth. You remember? The baby jumped because the Holy Spirit came upon John. He was with John from birth. But when Jesus came, it wasn't just God with specific people at a specific time for a specific purpose. It was God coming in the middle of our mess to be with all of us individually. Whosoever will believe in Him. That's God with us to a whole new level. And that's why you can say, God is with me. It's a game changer. It's a game changer because it speaks of provision. If the bread of life, and nobody mentioned the bread of life as one of the names of Jesus, but it's, if the bread of life is with me, how many knows that I'm going to be taken care of? How many? All of the ones in the middle do. Y'all need to get with them. If I'm the bread of life, I'm going to be taken care of. Listen, it means protection. If God is for me, who can be against me? God is with me. Some of you heard about my near miss. I was working in the uh, attic on the heat just a week ago. And... Uh, Lisa remembers. Lisa heard the crash, didn't you, Lisa? Yeah, Lisa's like, I think pastor's hurt. <laughs> but back behind this wall, there's a crawl space. It's got a wooden ladder, and it's about 8 to 10 feet down to the steps of the baptistry. And so I was coming out of that hole, and I was coming out head first. First mistake, right? Come out head first. I bent down. I put one foot on the wooden ladder step. It snapped. Broke. So I'm going head first to the steps eight feet below me. Guys, that's a broken neck or a broken back. Right? I don't it was God. He was with me. That's all I can say. Y'all can do whatever you want to think. I know what happened. I reached down to grab the, the side of the ladder with my my left arm. But let's just say I'm not in the shape I used to be. In high school I could do many I did the most push-ups in high school in my class. Every time we did push-ups or pull-ups, I was pretty stout in my upper body strength in my own because I didn't weigh much. But uh, I grabbed, and I can't hold up my 200 pounds with my, with my left arm, all right? But the end of the ladder, which is just a wooden ladder, went up inside of my, I had blue jeans, went up inside of my jeans. It tore a hole. I didn't have a scratch on my leg. That's why Lisa's heard me call Pastor April on the phone from back there because I just knew I was just all tore up. The ladder went up inside of my pants and caught me by my pants. And I hung upside down. Yeah. And what I thought of these things, I learned how to pray. I pulled myself back up inside there in that hole and I just sat there and I thanked God. Because I should have broke my neck or my back or something. But I didn't have a scratch on me. And, and I don't care what you think. God was with me. Right? In the middle of my stupidness, He was with me. I'm so glad God didn't just wait for our smart moments to be with us. Amen. <laughs> it means protection. It just does. The presence of God. We overwhelmingly underestimate God's presence in our life to know that He's with us and what that can mean. Everybody that encountered Jesus was affected by Jesus in a drastic way. You read your Bible, people didn't have a casual relationship with Jesus. They either said, I, can't, I ain't having a part of this guy, or they was drastically affected by Him. Now, I know today in the church we have people with a casual relationship with Jesus. I don't know if that's possible. To have His presence near you, it affects you. It changes you. 
And I'm afraid a lot of us struggle because we don't understand the fact that He's with us. He's with us. He's with us. I think of blind Bartimaeus that called out, you know, as Jesus passed by, he called out and yelled. He didn't care what people were saying to him. Many of us are like blind Bartimaeus that needed our eyes to be open. But instead, we fail to cry out to God because we don't realize what he can do since he's with us. Remember the woman with the issue of, the issue of blood and pressed through? Well, many, many of us have that problem. We're like the woman with the issue of blood, but, but we, we fail to press through because we don't understand He's with us to help stop the bleeding in our life. Some of us are like the centurion who had a, 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 a servant at home that was dying. And we fail to petition God on behalf of our children, on behalf of our family that we think are hopeless and helpless and won't ever give their life to God. The centurion understood something. This man right here is here for me. And he's with me. I'm going to take advantage of this. I'm going to ask him. Because I believe he can do it. We've got to understand this. This is a game. It's a game changer for us. To know that he's with us. But here's a part that I hadn't thought about. That I thought about last night. I thought I was through the message. And God added this last night as I was laying in the bed. Looking at my iPad. He, he brought this as I was looking over these notes. The fact that He's with us means this. He sees what we do. that would change you. He hears what we say. I can, I, can, I, can, I can talk about you behind your back and hope that you never hear about it. But God heard me. He's with me. I can make false assumptions about you and have an opinion about what you think about me or, and I can try to get everybody else on my side. God knows. He's with me. In my car. On my job. In my bedroom. In my living room. He's with me. He sees. We, can't, we cannot hide. We can't just go hide from Him and sin because He's with us. I know some people have a God that's constantly erasing your name and writing it back and erasing your name and writing it back. And, and so what that develops is, is you think you can just go off and hide the sin and come back and let Him write your name back down. Hey, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches you that when He's with you, He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And so you can't hide. Listen, you've got to hear this today. When you're sinning, He's with you. He sees what you're looking at. He hears what you're listening to. He hears what you're saying. Next time you're on the phone, huh? Next time you're off somewhere in the corner, talking quietly, you know? The one that matters most is in your ear. The one that matters most is right here in your heart. He knows what you're saying. He does. I can't refuse to give, refuse to serve, refuse to worship and hope that nobody notices because the one that matters the most, he's already noticed. You ever thought about that? Oh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel is with us. Praise the Lord. I'm undefeatable. Yeah, but he's also with you. He knows what's going on in your life. He wants to bring change. That's why he's the game changer. Help me out, worship team. I want to share one more thing with you today about Jesus. Because it's hard for us to talk about Emmanuel without talking about the cross. It's hard to talk about Christmas without talking about the cross because He was born to die. He's the only person that ever chose to die. You say, what about someone who takes their own life? They didn't choose, they, they didn't choose to die, they just chose to die sooner. This was God. He was in glory. Eternal. He chose to come and die. Let's stand. Nothing says Emmanuel greater than Jesus with his arms stretched out on the cross. Nothing says it greater. That's Jesus saying, I'm with you. That's Jesus saying, 
I've come in the middle of your mess. The Lord Himself has come. And I've taken your robe of filth, dirty rags, and I've placed it upon myself. The Bible says He became sin. You understand that? He didn't knew no sin, became sin. Think about this. Someone that's, someone that's never taken a drug, never taken a drug, but all of a sudden feels the weight of a life of drugs. All of a sudden feels the weight of a life of addiction. All of a sudden feels that weight. That makes me, that makes me want to cry. When I think about the failures in my life, when I think about the tears I've cried on my bed, of decisions I've made and things I've done, and I think that Jesus, you know, because I cried, but guess what? I deserve to feel that way because I made the decisions and I did those things. I thought those thoughts. But Jesus knew no sin, but yet he still felt all that weight. The sin of the world was placed upon him, even though he knew no sin. He got all the weight from it placed upon his life, and he became, he became sin. Hey, that's him saying, I'm with you. I'm with you. You know what his stretched out arm is saying to you? A handshake is only as good. It's only good when the, when the other person reciprocates, right? You know what's embarrassing? You gotta shake somebody's hand and they'll take their hand out of their pocket and they just nod at you. That's sort of embarrassing, isn't it? The handshake's only good when somebody reciprocates. No, leave them in your pocket. Leave them in your pocket. Don't move. Jesus is saying, I'm with you. But if you don't shake my hand, you haven't received what I did. Right? But when you shake it, you're saying, I accept. I'm with you. And so God is saying, I got you. I'm with you all the way. Whatever you face, whatever you go through, I'm here. That's what the cross is saying. I'm with you, Dennis. I'm with you. And you receive that. That's Emmanuel. That's Emmanuel. He's God with us. I don't know what you need to do today. You know, maybe you just need, as they sing a few lines of this song, maybe you just need to raise your hand and say, God, I'm so glad you're with me. Because maybe you've been struggling and you feel like God isn't. Well, God's telling you today, He is. He is. Maybe you need to come and pray. Maybe you need for me to pray for you. Whatever you need, I want, I want us to do that in the next, give me five minutes. Let's give God five minutes here to do what He wants to do. As they sing this song, it says, God with us. I want you to know that He's with you. Hallelujah. Who are we that you would be mindful of us? What do you see that's worth looking our way? We are free. 